So the UberX will drop you off at a skyport and you'll be able to get on your aircraft, your EV toll to fly across the city and land at a, another skyport very, very quickly, flying at anywhere from 150 miles per hour to 200 miles per hour to get across the city while the rest of the city is stuck in uh, gridlock. You're listening to the Drone Radio Show podcast, the show about drones and the people who use them for business, fun, and research. Hosted by Randy Goers. Hello, everyone. This is Randy Goers, and welcome to the Drone Radio Show podcast, episode 164. Are drones the answer to urban mass transit challenges? One company thinks they could be. Mark Moore is Engineering Director for Vehicle Systems at Uber Elevate, Uber's light aircraft ride-sharing project. There he is working on the next generation of urban mobility solutions that involve air passenger drones. Prior to joining Uber, Mark worked for NASA for over 32 years, the entire time focusing on conceptual design studies of advanced aircraft concepts. His research focused on understanding how to best integrate the emerging technology of electric propulsion and automation to achieve breakthrough on-demand aviation capabilities. He left NASA for Uber to make electric veto flight a reality. In this episode of the Drone Radio Show, Mark talks about Uber's passenger drones, its planned future commuter service, and its impact on cities and regions. But before we hear from Mark, I want to thank those of you who have been supporting my funding campaign on Patreon. For as little as $1 per month, you can help defray the cost of production and keep the podcast going and growing. Go to patreon.com slash drone radio show to join the team. Now let's learn about an exciting air mobility solution with Mark Moore of Uber Elevate. Let's pick up the interview where I asked Mark to introduce himself. I'm Mark Moore. And I'm the uh, engineering director of vehicle systems for Uber Elevate. And basically, I'm in charge of uh, making sure we get these new electric veto aircraft to show up for testing in 2020 and to be certified by 2023. Mark, tell us about Uber Elevate. Why was it created and what is its mission? Elevate at its core is aerial ride sharing. So it is being able to take what Uber does on the ground and be able to take it up into the air to rise above the congestion and be able to help cities be even more productive, even though traffic congestion is getting worse and worse in the major cities in the world. How did Uber decide to jump into the area of aerial ride sharing? Two and a half years ago, I uh, approached Uber uh, when I was at NASA and I had been at NASA for 32 years and The entire time at NASA, I worked on vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, advanced concepts and technologies. And over the past decade at NASA, I had been uh, one of the pioneers developing new electric vertical takeoff and landing technologies, specifically distributed electric propulsion. So, uh, you know, I led three different flight demonstrators at NASA and saw that the technology was ready to be commercialized and thought of, hey, who would be a great market leader to capitalize and take advantage of this new technology? Because while NASA is great at leading technology, they have nothing to do with the marketplace and, and no knowledge of the marketplace. So I had uh, that first meeting back in August of 2015 with the CEO and, and several vice presidents, as well as the chief product officer, Jeff Holden. And Jeff really cued in on understanding the potential of this technology to be able to augment what Uber is currently doing on the ground, but for longer distances in the air to really connect a city together with higher speed, higher productivity transportation. So Jeff uh, jumped on it and uh, started doing studies and um, within a year proved to himself and the other uh, executive uh, leadership that this was something that they really needed to do. And that's when uh, Jeff started hiring the team and brought me over from NASA. That's a pretty interesting story. I hadn't realized how evolved the research was. Did NASA produce a flying prototype? Not just one, but three different prototypes. So there's a first one, which 
actually NASA didn't even fund, which was called the GL-10. GL stands for Greased Lightning. So it was the first one that we did at NASA in terms of a distributed electric propulsion flight demonstrator. And it was just a, a UAV, a drone which was uh, about 62 pounds and a 10-foot span, so a relatively small vehicle. But we flew that successfully for for several years. We did many, many transition flights, and that's really the hardest part of uh, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. It's easy to hover. It's easy to fly forward. It's really hard to transition between hovering and flying forward, especially in that that approach from a cruise flight into a hover. So that was the first demonstrator, and that was completely successful. So then, uh, uh, in fact, it was funded by another government agency, not by NASA. But when that uh, proved so successful, then NASA jumped in and funded the second demonstrator, which was a full-scale distributed electric propulsion wing system. And that was called Leap Tech. We only had about a million and a half dollars for that, so we couldn't afford to put it into a wind tunnel to do a, a detailed data collection because we really wanted to have it be large scale and and the large wind tunnels are many millions of dollars alone just for the facility. So we decided to build what looks like a Mad Max truck and put this 32 foot span wing on the top of a semi truck and built this really unique floating structure so that the entire wing system floated on airbags. And as we drove across the desert with this semi-truck and the wing 24 feet up in the air, we could actually collect really good data. And in fact, that Leap Tech data set proved just how effective distributed electric propulsion is to achieve much higher coefficients of lift, much higher amounts of lift with much smaller wings. So that was a really successful second proof of what distributed electric propulsion could do. And then that encouraged NASA to fund the third demonstrator, which is the X-57 X-plane, which is still underway at NASA and is, in fact, the first manned X-plane in 25 years that NASA has done. And again, that X-plane is all about proving all the different wonderful things that distributed electric propulsion does from increasing lift to decreasing noise to increasing efficiency. Uh, It really is a a pretty remarkable new technology that is letting people design aircraft in completely new way. Is there a simple way to describe distributed electric propulsion? Distributed electric propulsion is taking advantage that electric motors and controllers, they don't care how big or small they are at any scale, at any size. They are greater than 95% efficient. They are very compact. They're very reliable. And they're very quiet. Um, And they achieve a great power to weight. So that isn't true. None of those things are true for turbine engines or spark ignition engines, which are the two competing technologies. So when you have a scale invariant technology like electric motors and controllers, That essentially encourages the ability to distribute them across the airframe, across the aircraft, without any penalty. So you can have several of these small propulsors and electric motors instead of having one large motor. That's the inherent difference. For instance, a helicopter has one large turbine engine and one really big rotor. While, you know, these new electric VTOL aircraft you see will have six or 12 or 18 different motors and propulsors. And by distributing them across the airframe, again, you're able to achieve moments and control forces that let you fly at any speed very, very precisely with robust control. So it is essentially a whole new way to design aircraft that takes you away from this idea that, you know, you only use one or at most two engines and propulsors. And uh, again, the beauty of it is uh, you end up with a quieter vehicle that has built-in redundancy. So there's no single engine, uh, you know, single fault issue. If one motor fails, it's fine. Uh, You can still fly uh, and land successfully because you have 
redundancy built into the list and control solution. With these engines, is it possible to get more flight minutes per battery? Is that one of the benefits? Electric aircraft in general, I mean, batteries are the Achilles heel, right? I mean, that's what's uh, the severe constraint. Batteries just don't store as much energy as gasoline or, you know, other hydrocarbon forms of fuel. So there really is a very severe energy constraint on electric aircraft where they They have to be very, very efficient. They don't have a lot of energy available to them. And again, that is a really good thing about electric motors is they're very, very high efficiency. Again, uh, greater than 95%. While with a turbine or reciprocating engine, they're, uh, you know, more like 28 to 32% efficient. So for every gallon of gas that you put in, you're only getting about uh, 30% of that in usable work, while an electric motor, you get almost all of the electricity turned into usable work. So, you know, this helps to reduce the amount of energy. But um, yeah, the batteries are definitely a, a limiting factor for electric flight. And that's why it's really important that we find initial markets for electric aircraft that don't require long distance flight. And that's exactly what aerial ride sharing is about. It's about having a flight over a major metropolitan area where the longest distance you take is on the order of 50 or 60 miles. And that that matches up very well with what batteries are able to achieve in terms of range. 50 to 60 miles is still a pretty sizable distance, though. Yeah, it's it's enough to do productive trips. And for Uber Elevate, uh, again, it's about urban air mobility and being able to provide very rapid transit for people living in these major metropolitan areas. And there's very, very high trip density in these urban areas. And so that's why we're focusing with that market instead of trying to connect city to city, which would require longer distances, better batteries. And in fact, there's more trips to serve in the metropolitan area with these shorter distances. So it makes it a a more vibrant and robust market opportunity. You may know that I'm a city planner here in Tampa. And for years, our region has struggled trying to fund a rail transit system. It's become a huge issue. And there's a lot of attention directed at alternative modes of transit these days. Wow, that's really interesting because, I mean, one of the neat things about this urban air mobility um, solution is that you know, you're rising into the third dimension. So instead of being stuck on two-dimensional ant trails on the ground, this new transportation solution is able to overcome geographic barriers. So as you're looking at Tampa or other cities that are close to the water, you know, especially problematic for the design of those transportation systems are bridges and other constraints where you end up having to try to funnel all the traffic through a single choke point. And again, the beautiful thing about a three-dimensional transportation solution is you don't have those choke points and and the geographic barriers just go away. Yeah, exactly. So let's talk about Uber's passenger drone concept. Are the drones depicted in the Uber promotional materials similar to what we can expect to see once the service is rolled out? Yeah, we've made uh, two different movies that kind of give people a better idea of uh, what to expect from this new urban uh, air mobility transportation solution. We show a couple representative concepts. Those aren't actually being built. They're Uber concepts that we've generated. We actually have five different partners that are building vehicles for us now at their own expense who are you know, much better equipped to actually develop the, the hardware Professional aerospace companies such as Embraer and Bell and Aurora Boeing, you know, all are each developing a a different vehicle. We don't call them passenger drones, though. So, I mean, we will have pilots, uh, at least for the first, you know, five to 10 years. We need to conduct several million trips with the autonomy, you know, with the vehicle intelligence to prove that the vehicle is ready to fly itself similar to what we're doing on the ground with self-driving cars. So, you know, once we can do several million flights and prove out the software, 
Then we'll look at replacing the pilot and make these eVTOL aircraft uh, become drones. If they're not drones, what do you call the service? We use several different terms. Aerial ride sharing, I think, is the most descriptive. Uh, again, the vehicles we call eVTOL, which is a little bit of an awkward name, but starting to catch on. Yeah, and, and, and the overall market we've essentially called urban air mobility. Can you walk us through how the service will work? Yeah, so it'll, it'll work exactly the same way as your Uber app works today. And that is you push on the Uber logo on your smartphone and, and it comes up and you're presented several different options. And Uber Air will be um, one more option that's, that's presented, which will provide significant time savings. So while an Uber X or a Uber Premium will provide a certain arrival time estimate, the Uber Air that's also shown in the app will be a, a much faster trip. And so if you choose that option for Uber Air, you would have an UberX car pull up and, and drive you to the closest Skyport. Skyports are where these aircraft fly to and from so that they don't fly to your driveway. They only fly from Skyport to Skyport. So the UberX will drop you off at a Skyport and you'll be able to get on your aircraft your EV toll to fly across the city and land at a, another Skyport very, very quickly, flying at anywhere from 150 miles per hour to 200 miles per hour to get across the city while the rest of the city is stuck in uh, gridlock. And then uh, you'll have an UberX waiting there, you know, at the destination uh, Skyport to be able to finish your trip and take you to a uh, complete door-to-door -door transportation solution. Or, you know, as we see it, again, you, you have urban planning in, in your blood. We see that this will really enable cities to be designed differently and that you're going to find with this nodal transportation system that's pathway independent that uh, will tend to encourage clustering and that instead of needing to even take an UberX, that you'll find that these Skyport nodes, you know, encourage um, the equivalent of a subway stop, and that people will be able to walk to Skyports, fly across to another node, another Skyport, and again, walk to their destination. So we, we see this as, you know, a solution that's going to really open up new degrees of freedom for city planners to go to a node-based transportation system that is pathway independent. Can you talk about the landing stations and the level of service we might expect? How many people are we talking about using the system? Yeah, actually, we just had our second annual Elevate Summit. And at that uh, summit last month, we showed how we're working with 10 different architectural firms to develop these new Skyports. And in fact, if you Google uh, Uber Skyports, uh, you'll be able to see many, many different renderings for how we see these uh, evolving to be able to be much more than a single helipad, but in fact, be able to achieve throughput of uh, even for the smaller ones of 150 vehicles per hour and the larger ones on the order of a thousand vehicles per hour. And each one of these vehicles are carrying uh, four passengers because we're aggregating uh, passengers together just like we do with Uber Pool on the ground today. So, you know, the ability to get 4,000 passengers per hour through even one Skyport is very much in our mind with these designs. You know, that's really fascinating. In our city, we have several large mixed-use redevelopment projects being constructed, especially in our downtown. I think there's an opportunity to look at how facilities like Skyports, drone delivery bays and such, can be integrated into new development projects. Even though the service is really a ways off, it's much easier to accommodate the space now than to retrofit later. You really mentioned a, an important thing, is, and that is as cities try to replan and design to be even more productive, trying to design in new ground transportation systems when the cities are already formed is a really, really expensive and, you know, long time value proposition. You know, as you try to put in uh, new highways or subways, or light rail. I mean, quickly, just even doing a 12-mile light rail is, is uh, over a billion dollars for a city to undertake. 
And so it, it, it ends up that uh, you have to buy lots of right-of-ways and, again, putting in a relatively small subway or light rail solution takes many, many years and sometimes even decades. So what's really different about what we're providing as a new transportation solution is that it's very infrastructure light. And that is we burden the vehicle tremendously to have this great capability to be quiet, to be ultra safe, to be fast, to be efficient. But the sky ports, the infrastructure required is really minimalistic, it is quite small because these are aircraft can take off and land vertically. So, I mean, that is the big difference is, you know, we see being able to develop this infrastructure very, very quickly at relatively low cost once we have these vehicles and to be able to put these sky ports in many, many different locations um, very quickly to enable cities to have more choice in how they develop new transportation throughput solutions. Again, as a planner, I appreciate everything that you've said, especially the part about infrastructure costs. Well, and that's the interesting thing about cities. You know, if you look back in history, right, going back to the early 1900s, you look at a city like New York and, you know, they they had to fight to figure out how to be able to increase the density and still be productive. And, you know, what did they do? They grew up. They took advantage of the third dimension and started building skyscrapers. And that's essentially what we're doing, too, with this new transportation system. Instead of staying on the ground, we're building up to provide a three-dimensional solution. How is Uber addressing the question of aerospace integration and coordinating with the FAA? Yeah, that's a great question. So the important thing to realize is that if we had these aircraft today, we could fly them just like helicopters across the city. So there isn't a fundamental block to being able to fly these vehicles. Helicopters already do it today. The problem is, is that if you want to fly hundreds of these vehicles or even thousands of these vehicles over a city, then things have to change. And specifically, uh, you know, this is one of the areas where Uber is adding a a great deal of value and making a great deal of investment. So as I mentioned before, we're not building our own vehicles. We have five companies that are are developing, building, and certifying aircraft for us. But we are developing the network management and airspace management solution so that we can operate these vehicles at scale. And it's particularly challenging over major cities because most major cities also have a major airport. And that means that there's Class B airspace. There's highly regulated airspace by the FAA at each one of these major metropolitan airports. So one of the reasons why we uh, selected Dallas as the first city where we'll be conducting commercial operations in 2023 is because we've been able to establish a great partnership with DFW Airport, FAA, and NASA, because FAA and NASA have a a joint facility called NTX right at the DFW Airport, which has been pioneering advanced airspace solutions for many years. So we're already working out with DFW, uh, NASA, and FAA in performing simulation studies that show how we can establish Uh, essentially corridors or traffic lanes uh, in the sky and be able to ensure that the vehicles self-separate and are able to space themselves appropriately without any uh, human controller interacting with the vehicles through voice communications. And that's how it's done today with large aircraft. But these new small aircraft are going to have quite a bit of autonomy, uh, advanced sensors, advanced computers, that let them self-separate and know where each other are and be able to do that in a very consistent and safe manner, even with a high traffic volume. And as I understand it, in 2020, the plan is to begin a demonstration program for this concept. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so in 2020, we'll have the first experimental versions of these new electric VTOL aircraft. And so the key thing that we want to do is demonstrate them in urban areas to prove out just how quiet and just how safe they are. Because uh, eVTOL really differentiate themselves from helicopters in those two areas. And essentially these eVTOL, from what I've seen and heard, 
are able to be about 15 decibels quieter than the quietest helicopter of the same size. And that is a remarkable breakthrough. So we very much see these electric VTOL as being able to be good neighbors, uh, especially when the skyports are you know, located close to freeways, so you have high background noise anyway, that they will be a very, very low annoyance to the urban landscape. And that's absolutely key to us, right? For this to, to catch on as a mainstream transportation solution, they must be community friendly. So that's what the 2020 uh, test flights will prove out. And again, we'll be starting with those 2020 test flights in Dallas and uh, working with our partners there. Hillwood Properties in Frisco Station is developing the first sky ports for the Dallas-Fort Worth-Frisco Plano area. And uh, we'll be uh, flying and proving out just how, how great these vehicles are in 2020. And then that will provide the confidence for the manufacturers to invest in the certification of those vehicles so that by 2023, they're ready for commercial flight. Tell us about the other demonstration cities. So we've announced also Los Angeles as one of the early adopter cities that will start commercial operations in 2023. We'll also uh, conduct some test flights in Los Angeles. And for the third city, we're actually doing a competition for an international city. So we haven't yet selected a, a third international city, but there's many great contenders and We're working with those cities to uh, see which one is most appropriate as another early adopter for the commercial flights in 2023. What is the Uber Elevate conference and why is that important to Uber? Yeah, so uh, just in May, we had our second annual Elevate Summit and it was extraordinary. Again, it's just the second year that we've done it. The first year, there were about three to 400 people there. So a rather small gathering where we introduced this idea of urban aerial ride sharing. And the second year, actually, we had 950 people at a conference center in Los Angeles. And we actually, we had to turn away 250 people who were actually mad that they couldn't attend. So, I mean, that's one thing to realize. This industry is on fire. It is growing leaps and bounds across every single dimension. There's currently 75 companies out there developing electric veto aircraft. It's mind-boggling where, you know, if you talked about this two or three years ago, you were crazy. And now everybody's developing these vehicles because they see what the technology can do for both distributed electric propulsion and autonomy. Also, in terms of like real estate investment and the autonomy technologies, And I mean, you name it, and everything is starting to come together very, very quickly. And my final question, Mark, what message would you like to leave in regard to Uber's role in the air mobility sector? People are really going to be surprised how quickly this happens, because I know it sounds science fiction, sounds like flying cars, but... The time frame that we're talking about is really serious. It's really doable. It's definitely a complex engineering undertaking that has a lot of moving parts, but there's billions of dollars of investment going into this now, and it's very achievable. So it's going to happen closer than people think. And that's uh, really exciting to, you know, to be part of. And especially, you know, again, I'm so excited to hear that, that you're an urban planner because, I mean, what people need are a new tool in their toolkit, right, to solve the problems that society has. And we're really excited to be able to provide a, a new tool for urban transportation that just rises above the ground congestion problem. That's it for episode 164 of the Drone Radio Show. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Mark Moore of Uber Elevate and learning about their air mobility service. I want to thank Mark for taking the time to speak with me. If you want to learn more about Uber Elevate or want to connect with Mark, check out the webpage at uber.com slash info slash elevate. If you like the Drone Radio Show, please consider supporting the podcast with a small donation. The content is always free, but for as little as $1 per month, you can help defray the cost of production. To donate, go to patreon.com slash drone radio show.
Thanks for listening. Your support means a lot to me, and I hope you'll listen to more episodes of the Drone Radio Show podcast to hear how others are using drones for business, fun, and research. For the Drone Radio Show, I'm Randy Gores. This has been the Drone Radio Show podcast. More information on today's show can be found on our website at www.droneradioshow.com. If you're using drone technology for business, fun, or research, and would like to share your experience on the show, please visit our website and fill out a guest appearance application. And don't forget to follow us on your favorite social media channels.